So, so glad you're joining us. I am going to get, it is 1230 on the nose here by my clocks. Uh, and I am going to give us maybe just like two minutes before we get rolling. Uh, in past in past gatherings, there's been a that was the uh, promised two minutes, and and uh, so in that two minutes, we've had some folks join. So welcome to everyone in the gallery in the Zoom gallery. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Josh Christ, and I am uh, one representative of a team uh, who got together and and. Uh, I put together our Health Career Pathway Field Trip Friday series. Uh, we've got members of groups, including uh, the University of Illinois Extension, um, West Central Illinois AHEC, which AHEC stands for Area Health Education Center Network, and uh, Spoon River College. Um, and we, it is our pleasure and our honor to be meeting with you here today. Um, so I will say that I am uh, going to go ahead. I'm going to be toggling between sh uh, sharing my screen, so a few slides, and uh, us looking at the gallery. Uh, so just a heads up, you're going to kind of get back and forth with that. So um, here's our schedule today. We've got, I, I thought it was really clever by calling it frameworks, uh, but it's the musculoskeletal health. Uh, segment. We're going to do that. We're going to take a small break and then we're going to um, have our final session of uh, the spring semester uh, with integrative me uh, medicine. Uh, so real fast, just to let you all know that uh, I don't want to say that everyone um, in here is uh, is in high school, uh, but, but uh, I spent a large portion of my life, a former career as a high school educator, teaching uh, music and biology. Those things fit together just so neatly. Uh, and so um, I've come out to Illinois and I've joined uh, with SIU School of Medicine. And uh, here we are meeting together with a group of high school students. And uh, well, actually a whole assembled high school class where uh, is that Indian Valley over there with Beth. Hey, y'all. Uh, <laughs> right on. You got your scrubs and your masks. It's great to see. So real fast, I got a, a little, I just want to hit the level set and the Zoom etiquette. You know, this is a, a maximum respect zone. So we're, we're asking for positive attitudes. If possible, it's not always possible, but a, a distraction-free environment. It's really hard when you've got multiple tabs open. Um, and uh, we want to we want to hear your voices, so you can raise your hand and unmute to ask questions of our panelists. You can also um, you can also enter into the chat box, and Shelby will uh, do her best to uh, ask the questions when they come up. So please, uh, by all means, do ask these these folks have gathered here today. These uh, health professionals have gathered here today because they are really interested in seeing you as future health professionals get your feet on the road and 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 uh, and get as much clarity about where you're headed and why. And so they're here for you. So please take full advantage of that. Ask them questions. Um, so a brief tour. Uh, this is the fourth of four uh, events that we've done. So quickly, I'm going to just kind of recap. Um, so this is what's been happening. In January, we got together. We had a group of allied health professionals. Uh, similar to integrated medicine, allied health is, is kind of a, an area where uh, you know, not a lot of people, young people or people of all ages really know like, well, what, what does that entail? What, what you know, professions are in there. Uh, so that was great. We explored that. We explored uh, various professions associated with women's health. Um, and we covered the, the uh, in essential employability skill number one, which is personal ethic. And, and cultivating personal ethic is, is, a, is an interesting one to, uh, to give guidance on because it's really in your roots. It's deep integrity and, and a positive attitude. So always be working on that. Uh, February 19th, we had uh, a panel of women leaders in medicine. Uh, that was a really, really great segment. Um, 
and we also went behind the scenes. Uh, and, and so that was a really, that was a fun segment because our public, public health scientist, uh, Dr. Stolo, Jenny Stolo was hilarious and she cracked us all up. We covered the essential employability, essential employability skill number two, which is work ethic. It's, you know, how you go about the duties and the roles and the environment of your uh, professional life. Uh, then last month we had three panels. Uh, it was jam packed, and we had a uh, we had a one single me me medical imaging um, person, uh, and this person also is now uh, in upper level administration at the uh, hospital where she serves. Uh, we had three really brilliant uh, mental health professionals got together, and um, we had a really rich discussion there. Um, and about the helping professions is what one thing that I learned is one way we can call that. Uh, although all of these professions are pretty much helping professions. And then we had a segment on emergency medicine, the breakneck, fast paced, adrenaline rolling um, um, emergency medicine space. Uh, and then we covered essential employability skill number three. That says number two, but number three is communication. So uh, being a good listener and, uh, and transmitter of ideas and information. Uh, okay, and then, and then we're gonna cover our last essential employability skill in, uh, in just a little bit. But some overarching themes that we've been touching on throughout the entire spring are the, uh, the three Cs. Um, career ladders and team approaches. Uh, so, so the three C's are, are just essential. You should look at your pathway as, a, as, a, as perhaps a stepwise accumulation of skills and experience, that's the ladders part. And then um, no person is an island and it takes many people to give good person-centered care in health settings. So team approaches is critical. Uh, there we go with our uh, employability skills again. And today ours is teamwork. That's our fourth of four. Uh, and the subcomponents there are critical thinking, uh, being able to think outside the box, being able to challenge uh, an assumption that might be a, a, a misplaced assumption. So sound decision making and being able to circumvent problems. And then teamwork is also effect, effective in cooperative work. So just like we talked about the team approaches, uh, being able to work effectively with others, people that you get along with and people that you totally don't get along with, uh, you still got a job to do. And it's important to be able to figure out a good way to function as a team. It's it's absolutely critical. Uh, and then also using strategies and solutions and dealing with the conflicts and differences between team members. So that is teamwork. And so be thinking about that. The, uh, the attachment I sent out in emails uh, was that I asked you to, or we asked you to reflect on, on these in terms of what do you have already kind of going on? What, what of these aspects do you already have uh, alive within you, and then also what can you work on? What uh, maybe is something that you can uh, dedicate that your growth towards? Um, all right, so that was the overview stuff. Um, we are not annotating. I just wanted to say a shout outs to folks. I got, uh, I got stars on the map. I don't know if our UK registered people are here. I don't know if our Vancouver, uh, Canada people are here. Uh, we have uh, uh, we had some folks register from New York City. We have one shining star from New Orleans, and I hope that uh, I hope that these people <laughs> where the stars are are here. But the big star, it's the same size, is uh, is Illinois. So we're based out of Illinois, and uh, and so there's tons of people that register that are from Illinois. Um, and so I, I'll also say that. Um, you know, I want to give a big shout out to uh, East St. Louis Senior High School and Miss Stephanie Tate Patterson, largest attendance. Y'all flyers are setting the bar high. So props to the, uh, the East St. Louis squad. Uh, and I also, um, I don't know if the New Orleans attendee is here, but I am a NOLA native. So I wanted to give a shout out uh, to, to my hometown. And I was a teacher there for well, in New Orleans for seven years, so I miss home like crazy. Anyhow, uh, moving right along. Musculoskeletal health, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I am going to 
go ahead and break away from the share and we're now back in galleryville so so uh you know i'm gonna start right here musculoskeletal like gravity you know i love to blame it for my clumsiness uh and then not to portray the earth or nature as having any particular concern for me specifically as a teeny inhabitant of this place this biome uh, or certainly that it's got any sort of menacing thing, although it does continuously and without any real fluctuation ex exert significant force on our bodies. So I, I say clumsiness and then I say gravity, but <clears throat> that's how we stick to this rock, right? So nonetheless, it becomes obviously clear sometimes just how forceful these forces of nature and physics can be. So what I'm getting at here is that the... Uh, body systems whose function it is to hold shape and form and to move about is the musculoskeletal system and it has a very tough job to do so um so here we are with uh four panelists and uh i'm sorry i'm sorry three panelists today and they're veteran practitioners in mu musculoskeletal health uh one now holds a position in, in administrative leadership so i'm gonna intro really fast we are pleased to um <clears throat> sorry we are pleased to be joined by trenton cap sorry trenton clap he's a certified physician's assistant specializing in orthopedic surgery and as well serving as lead athletic trainer at carl richland hospital in only only illinois so mr clap attained degrees from eastern illinois and southern illinois universities and he practices also at a convenient cl clinic, uh, convenient care clinic on the weekends. Also with us today is Dr. Marcy Ganson. She's a physical therapist who also holds two directorships, one in rehabilitation services and the other as director of the Fitness Health and Wellness Center. All of these happen at Mason District Hospital in Havana, Illinois. So welcome. And we are pleased to welcome as well uh, Megan Taylor to this learning event. Ms. Taylor serves as lead sonographer at Carl Richmond, sorry, Carl Richland Memorial Hospital as well. If you notice the number of initials following Ms. Taylor's name, which I'll show you in just a moment, uh, it's because she's registered in many modalities of sonography, namely x-ray, mammography, She's a registered diagnostic medical sonographer in obstetrics, abdomen, general, and breast. She's also a registered vac vascular technologist and a registered diagnostic cardiac sonographer. Lots of syllables there. So welcome to you all. We're so thankful that you've chosen to share your Friday afternoon with us. And we're excited to learn more about your work, your pathways, and hear some expert advice. And we can't thank you enough. So welcome. Um, I'm gonna ask really fast, um, uh, Dr. Ganson, is my video frozen? Yes, it is. All right, let's try to unfreeze that. All right, I think now I might be unfrozen. All right, so I, um, I'd like to just start by taking a minute to hear from each of you. Um, would each of you briefly describe your current work roles? So I kind of named them, but can, can we describe what, what that uh, activities they entail. Um, all professions are equally important in my eyes, so we're gonna go alphabetically. So Mr. Clapp, Mr. Trenton Clapp, would you please begin and uh, just describe your work roles and the activities that they entail, please. Sure, so I, um, I do patient, see patients in the clinic and then I also first assist in the OR. Um, so on a clinic day, I, you know, see, examine, and treat all my patients. Sometimes I run it past my collaborating physician, who's an orthopedic surgeon, um, and we, um, you know, we we do have to work as a team because I do, as a physician assistant, have to work um, underneath a, an orthopedic surgeon. Um, so then on surgery days, you know, I go in, I scrub with him, um, perform the entire case with him from opening to closing. I do suturing. Um, do a lot of splinting, casting. Um, in the clinic, I do a lot of injections. We'll do some closed reductions of fractures in the clinic. Sometimes we have to take those to the OR as well. Um, as far as athletic training, I'm also the lead, so I just have some um, 
administrative roles there. Um, I don't really cover athletic games anymore, um, but I do show up to the games as a physician assistant on the sideline with our athletic trainers as well. Got you. And um, I just want to follow up. So um, when you said you were in terms of fractures, you used the term, a piece of, uh, what was the terminology you used just now? in terms of uh, getting a fracture to come together? Oh, closed reduction. Um, so so, closed closed reduction. so you're going to re reduce a fracture down to bring those bones together? Right. Sometimes we have to open them up, and that's a open reduction with internal fixation. So we'll put a plate in there, um, some screws, things like that. But sometimes we can do it where we just, you know, some traction, and it'll pop back into place. Gotcha. Um, and you actually probably hear it pop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it can be noisy. Great. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Clapp. And then uh, Dr. Ganson, G comes after C. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Josh said, my name is Marcy Ganson. I'm a physical therapist. I've been out around, uh, gosh, 25 years now. I injured my knee on a Division I full ride volleyball scholarship out west in Utah. And they redshirted me. I was a setter hitter, went through physical therapy, had a major surgery, um, thought, wow, this is a neat profession. Uh, don't believe physical therapy is always what it stands for because we can be pain and tortures uh, to some patients that we work with. But uh, my daily activities, you know, we have various patients in this rule setting that we see. We do inpatients which can be acute or what they call swing bed. Uh, it's like, a, say a sniff, a skilled nursing facility type setting. We also see outpatients. We have home health. We do a 30 mile radius around our Mason County. And then we have early intervention, which is birth to three. So I have physical, occupational, and speech therapists that work within my department, and we're very mobile people. Your body is meant to move. We have evaluations that we do on our clients um, from head to toe and from birth uh, to dying, if you will, the whole age-specific spectrum, if you will. We see all kinds of diagnoses, and uh, it's, it's quite uh, ongoing, I mean, lifelong learning profession. And uh, we have a few niches here with lymphedema, birth to three. We see various athletics, workman's comp, and uh, documentation. So, as he said, with some of your soft skills, you know, communication is key and being a team player and I'm trying to think of the other ones, being flexible and problem solver, all those is part of what we do every day when we work with, with patients. So excited to see you guys and feel free to ask questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Ganson. Uh, all right, and um, really appreciate that. And so Ms. Taylor, how about you? Would you run down um, the work that you do and, and the kind of the activities that they entail? Sure. So I work in diagnostic imaging. Some call it radiology. Um, in my department, we do x-ray, CAT scan, MRI, ultrasound, nuclear medicine, mammography. I myself do x-ray mammography, which is mammograms, and mostly ultrasound. And since I work at a smaller hospital, our ultrasound department does everything. OB, abdomen, breast, biopsies, cardiac, vascular exams, um, versus if you worked at larger hospitals, all those departments are separate, usually. Um, diagnostic imaging would maybe have x-ray, CAT scan, MRI, but a larger facility would break off and have just a cardiac ultrasound department, just a vascular, or just an OB, just an abdomen, usually on different floors. But myself, again, being at a smaller hospital, um, I do all of that every day. We take care of outpatients, scheduled exams, um, ERs, inpatients, usually add-ons. Um, we also have to take call when we leave here because we're again a smaller facility 
Um, just ultrasound has to take call. So that's in my daily routine after we leave at five o'clock. Um, our x-ray techs go over to the clinic, actually where um, Trenton's at. And so we will x-ray his patients before or after he sees them. So I like to say our department's kind of the heart of the hospital. You, you kind of need us to do a lot of diagnostic um, well, you do need us to do the diagnostic exams, but to make a diagnosis, you usually need some form of imaging in most cases. So that is one reason I really like my job is we do something different all the time. Well, thank you for that, Ms. Taylor, uh, for that description. And actually, this, this segues perfectly um, because I was reflecting on all of your bios and, and kind of the, the work that's in, that uh, the field does in general. Uh, and, and so speaking with you today, Ms. Taylor, this represents the third health professional during this spring series who's in imaging, who does imaging. And uh, your career ladder has, has many rungs as, as you, were sh you sh shared with me and, uh, and I shared uh, with the group. Um, and that in that, I mean, you, you've got played a wide variety of roles and you were just saying that like you, that uh, imaging is kind of is, is throughout the entire hospital, for lack of better words, in all of the clinics. And so um, I guess I, I would like to hear, would you speak to how this progression through the, uh, the getting the credentials and the specialties played out for you? Like there's a bunch of folks here that have joined us here that are e either like curious about or very dead already decided to go into the health professions. And so I think it's really good to be able to talk about how uh, you know, it, it, it oftentimes it's many small steps and it seems like you've got that. So would you mind speaking to how this progression of specialties and credentialing played out for you? I can sure try. Uh, <laughs> diagnostic image can kind of be a little confusing. Um, so I started by do, doing a two-year degree, which most x-ray programs are a two-year degree. So you can just do x-ray, graduate, and work just doing x-ray. Some hospitals would cross-train you in CAT scan. Um, and again, you could just leave it at that. But I went on to Carbondale, SIUC, and got my bachelor's in sonography. That same college also offers radiation therapy, and a nuclear, or I'm sorry, a MRI CT program. So I graduated with that. And then I was cross-trained in vascular and echo. So going into ultrasound, where people don't get, um, I guess, warned, if you work at a smaller hospital, ultrasound has changed a little because I've been doing it for 16 years. But back when I started, you would have to take a physics board with every anatomy. But now they just have one physics board that will get you to get a credential in everything. So I've taken mm -hmm. nine boards, but to break that down, say you worked at a larger hospital, you can take a board and get RDMS, which is your registered diagnostic medical sonographer. You will have to take an OB board and then an abdomen board. A lot of people there stop, but if you go on to vascular, which a lot of the colleges are offering vascular and echo now, that is another credential. You have to take your RVT, which is your vascular, and then your heart, your echo is RDCS, registered diagnostic cardiac sonographer. So I have all of that. Um, they have changed it where you can go straight into sonography. You don't have to do x-ray first, but back when I started, you had to. That was step one, huh? Yes, I personally would, um, if you're going to work at a smaller hospital, I would do x-ray and then ultrasound or CAT scan or nuclear medicine, um, radiation therapy, something else, a four-year degree. Because then you're, you're gonna be more valuable. If I quit here and went to a larger facility, I could apply to just MAMO. 
just x-ray, just ultrasound OB or abdomen or cardiac or vascular. I mean, my jobs would be endless. Um, but if you just go to sonography school, ultrasound school, mm -hmm. that's all you're going to be able to do. And if you work at a smaller hospital, they're going to want you to be able to at least have your license to do x-ray. Does that make sense? I mean, the, the options are endless in diagnostic imaging. Yeah, and I think that's a I uh, I think that's an important message uh, to to convey to to the uh, aspiring health professionals here, um, in terms of preparing positioning oneself to to be as marketable and useful uh, in a broad set of positions. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, Cool. So I would like to take a minute. Um, Dr. Ganson was generous enough to uh, to put together a set of slides regarding um, physical therapy and the pathway to get for one per, for a person to get themselves into uh, physical therapy school. Um, and and uh, so if that that. Uh, is an, a very involved process. So uh, Dr. Ganson, would you mind um, kind of navigating us, taking us on, on a tour through uh, that process, please? Yes, okay. So if anybody would need a copy of these slides, Josh and I had talked and we're more than happy to, to get them to you because it is a, you know, kind of a step-by-step -step process. Um, the slides will be coming up soon, and this is how you move towards a physical therapy career. Next Are the slides slide. up right now, Dr. Ganson? Yes, I can see them. Perfect. Okay, good. Thank you. Certainly. Let's roll. All right. So a quick overview, you know, PT careers, how you go through the education, some admission process, and really asking yourself, is this PT career right for you, you know, and some resources you guys can touch base on. All right, so, you know, we're movement experts and probably as Tritton and as Megan can tell, you know, we have to get our patients up and going and they want us to fix them, right? But physical therapy, you know, in the healthcare profession, we can diagnose a therapy diagnosis. We treat all ages from birth, like I said earlier, to, to dying. And we really want to figure out how we can get these patients to be able to move back to their prior level of function and to be able to perform their activities of daily living. Some of those roles, um, besides being able to diagnose and imagine, manage movement, um, we wanna restore, we wanna maintain and promote that optimal function. Um, as he said earlier, I'm also over fitness, health and wellness and just looking at that quality of life. Next slide, please. You know, where do physical therapists work? Uh, all those settings that you see, and I think I told you, and as Megan was talking about, in a small, small rural setting, I get so many students that want to come work here after their internship because they like all the settings we serve. And if you want to travel, those are various jobs you can take as well. Some of the conditions you guys can see here, I don't want to belabor and read verbatimly, but we see a wide variety of diagnoses as physical therapists. Some of the core values, um, you know, being accountability, you know, you as students, you have to look at these core values as a human being, you know, and look at your moral compass, but altruism, that compassion and caring, excellence, integrity, professional duty, and your social responsibility within your community. We find that being a physical therapist, we have high job satisfaction, as some of these say, you know, PT employment experience is expected to grow by 39%. One of the best jobs in America is the US News and World Report. We're a fast growing job and highest growth expectancy in the rural areas. Some of the benefits, we make a difference. We, we help people move again. We have job security. A lot of us love our jobs. We might be pretty stressed, but we can pick our location. And some people, some therapists are private practice owners as well and can be entrepreneurs in the, within the profession. Here's what we were talking about to become a physical therapist. It's now a doctoring profession. Uh, we're trying to practice at the highest scope of our practice. And you have to look for a school that's accredited by this 
Commission on Accreditation and Physical Therapy Education and pass a licensure examination. Depends what your bachelor's degree is, your master's, if you get uh, it directly accepted into a PT program, it could be three years. So there's a lot of detail there within your education. Next slide. Here are some of the classes you might wanna look into as well as um, just you know, a well-rounded elective program, uh, just getting some of your AP classes and understanding how the body moves. I talked a little bit, we do take a lot of students here. You can go on and get your clinical residency as well as do a clinical fellowship and really hone in on some of those skills like Trent and Megan do within their profession, so. Some of the certifications, um, I'm actually uh, have an advanced competency in home health. I'm credentialed in that. Uh, they don't have a specialty certification yet, but you can see the various parts of the body that you can become certified in. Ways you can prepare. Really look at this slide. Um, I don't wanna go take all your time, but to be able to get into a physical therapy career, these are some of the steps and prerequisites, things you, you're gonna to wanna to do, and you definitely wanna do your research and apply early. And to reiterate what Dr. Ganson said off the top up, I'm gonna make sure and share these, this, this, these materials with uh, the group that's gathered here today, so. This is now a new website that you can submit all those types of papers and applications that you need to go through. I didn't have that when I applied, but it's really slick now. So some of the common college courses are there. And these are some of the, the courses that people come out with their bachelor's and master's in. So take a look at that if any of those interest you. Here are some of the GPAs. And the PT observation experience, as you guys are trying to figure out what career you wanna go into, I know with COVID-19, we're not letting a lot of people in the hospitals unless you're there for you know, your family, a loved one, but really try to figure out how you can observe and get those hours in a lot of variety of settings, whether it's nursing home, home health, being a candy striper, volunteering, you know, working in gift shops, anything you can do to get your foot in the door and gain that experience is invaluable. So what you're saying is in, in kind of in pretty much any role within the facility is going to bring value and, and some exposure to what it's like to do to be in that environment and do that kind of work, huh? Yes, my mother was a registered nurse. I uh, was hired in as a CNA and I worked with housekeeping. I worked in dietary. I mean, from the ground up, you really want to know the workings of a hospital. So some of the in, uh, other factors within the admission process Practice your interviews, look at various state residencies. You know, I applied, took my test in Illinois and Ohio because I didn't know where I wanted to live when I grew up. Uh, get all those extra classes, be a vice president's president, if you will, of certain organizations and program, get a good work experience and try to diversify if you can. That's a really important uh, interview process. Oh yeah, all those, here's some pitfalls. Let's go over those real quick. Let's hit the pitfalls, that's important. Yeah, just make sure your applications do not have any errors or any you know, grammatical mistakes. They really don't like late ap applications. Watch your behavior you know, when you're doing your pre-physical therapy observations. Some of these soft skills Josh is teaching you is invaluable. Always try to dress the part. Uh, uh, do your research, look at the prerequisite courses, and make sure you check your emails. <laughs> so That one's critical for, for, <laughs> for everybody. To, today more than ever, I, I think. Uh, great. All right. Thank you very much. And then um, just to quickly kind of tour through the rest, there's some testimonials from some pr practitioners, some professionals, just how much they love their work. And then there's some resources. So we'll get those to you. Um, thank you for, for sharing all of that, uh, Dr. Ganson. Really appreciate it. Um, so I, um, 
I guess I'd like to get into this piece of it. I think it's important for for the for the folks that have gathered here, the, the aspiring health professionals, to to consider, um, you know, what types of uh, what types of health professions are would be good fits, either personality wise or skill set, strong suit. Uh, and so ranking like ranking a person's experience of pain or the type of pain against another is, is virtually impossible. But suffice it to say that when we're considering the pain associated with deep structural tissues like bone fractures and torn connective tissues like ligaments and tendons, that it can often be quite severe. And so um, I, I, Dr. Ganson, I just wanted to to. to to hear from you, what characteristics are important to have in the situations where the patient is experiencing severe levels of pain? And like, what do people interested in physical therapy have to know about themselves if they'd be a good fit in this regard? I think you really have to understand, you know, how there is a major opioid problem within the, the United States and the world. So being able to subjectively and objectively ask the patients about their pain level prior to any type of therapy treatment. And then while you're applying, whether it's manual therapy, hands-on, any home exercise program, any equipment that you're using with the patients during, you know, before, during, and after the intervention, you want to ask that patient about their pain level. And we have various pain scales that we use. We bring out, um, you know, pictures of pain scales. We have them rate one to 10 or point to diagrams with, you know, unhappy faces or happy faces. And, you know, we get gather that data. So you definitely need to understand the various di diagnoses and what you're working with. And my biggest platform in life and getting into this profession is how would I like to be treated? How would my loved ones, how would you like them to be treated? And when people are coming to see you, they've either, you know, just found out about this diagnosis. They're scared, they're in pain. And if you can have that soft, caring tone and try to do all you can to, to help them be able to find their goal, what is that patient's goal to be able to return back to whatever it was independently or as close to it as possible. I think what we call that prior level of function. That's so important to understand that and just to, to listen to your patients and then your skilled documentation, your skilled service will come and you'll know how to, to properly bill. But that's kind of the, the well-rounded uh, way of answering that question, Josh, if that's what you were asking for. Yeah, you covered a lot there. Thanks, Dr. Ganson, for sure. And I also wanted to uh, turn to you, uh, Mr. Clapp. You know, athletes are known to hold strong commitments and high endurance from the discomforts and rigorous training and long workouts. But they also risk sustaining unusually serious injury. And so I was, I was hoping to hear from you. Would you mind describing how, be, like, being an athletic trainer on one hand, you're trying to help people prevent injuries and then being in the operating room on the other hand where you're having to fix sometimes really severe injuries so um could, would you mind just speak like describing how how that is in in your mind and in your worldview and as a practitioner so you know i started my career as an athletic trainer i did it for a year and then i went on it was unfortunately a stepping stone for PA because PA is similar to PT and you have to have, you know, I follow the similar, you know, undergrad and you have, you know, you have to apply and, and interview and all that jazz. But anyway, um, as far as athletic training, I mean, you see them initially. Um, the goal is yes, to prevent, but the athletic trainers also do some of the treatment as well, you know, on some of the smaller things. Um, they do the initial kind of like your EMS, your emergency response on the sideline, you know, say it is like a knee dislocation, then they're going to stabilize it, which is one of the most severe um, athletic injuries we, we see. And we don't handle those at my facility. We have too small of a facility to do that um, because of the neurovascular injuries. Um, 
And then, you know, the athletic trainer can then get them back. Once we fix them on the orthopedic side, they can get them back and rehab them and start easing them back in. Um, so athletic training and physical therapy overlap in some areas. Um, I imagine. Fact, a lot of athletic trainers do work in physical therapy clinics doing rehab during the day. And then in the afternoon, they'll go to their school and, you know, see their athletes that are hurt and, and then, you know, they'll follow them through practice and then treat them after practice as well. Yeah. You'll certainly see a lot of like sports rehab, physical therapy clinics where it's, it's, uh, it's, it's all wrapped up in one. Uh, so great. Well, thank you for that. Um, I think what I'd like to do is I, I want to certainly leave some, some space for uh, the, for the future health professionals out there in the audience to, to ask some questions. Uh, but I did want to take a quick glimpse of the uh, orthopedic surgery work space. So um, it is not my intention to gross anyone out, uh, but I will say that if you, uh, you know, if you get queasy, uh, when you see something like that, uh, in, in the last few minutes that we have together here, uh, open the floor to uh, anybody who might have any questions. So future health professionals, aspiring health professionals, maybe some of y'all are already at work. Um, by all means, please uh, ask uh, these folks if you have any curiosities, any questions, you can either uh, ask them to be unmuted or throw those questions into the chat box. Um, so uh, all you folks. See if we get anybody. Come on, brave souls. These folks are here uh, for, for you all, so. Okay. Well. To any, any of those who saw my message earlier, you have now been able to unmute yourself to ask those questions directly. Oh, thank you. I was not monitoring the chat boxes thoroughly. I could have been. Okay, well, um, I, I want to say express deep gratitude um, to you three professionals for giving up some very valuable time and important time to, uh, to come join us and, and uh, share your experiences and your expertise and your advice. Um, can't thank you enough. Um, and really appreciate it. You all have a lovely Friday and we'll talk again sometime. Thank you. Thanks, thanks y'all. And to the folks uh, that have gathered here, we've got our, uh, our, our panel of uh, integrative health professionals uh, that are on board here, but we are gonna, we're gonna turn away for, uh, let's go for six minutes. I've got six minutes until 1.30. So um, we'll take a break till 1.30 and then who uh, has stepped away on the break? Uh, yeah, all right. Well, uh, welcome Indian Valley class back. Glad that you all are on for the integrative health session. Um, and, uh, and then welcome now to the, uh, the health professionals that have joined us here, the panelists. So glad to have you here. Um, I'll intro just to say, you know, that uh, throughout the spring semester, the Field Trip Friday series, We've, uh, we've covered all kinds of topics. We went through the tour. We took the tour at the beginning of the first session. Um, and, and I imagine that some of them are unknown to many of the uh, folks in attendance, you know, allied health professions, public health scientists, medical laboratory sciences, you know, maybe not really well known or even known of at all, just to name a few. But I have a suspicion that integrative health might take top prize in the obscure medical field category, even though a great many of us have sought and perhaps regularly do activities and treatments that fall into this broad category of health and wellness. And so that's why I'm excited to close this, the entire Field, field Trip Friday series with such an interesting field. It's a field that's animated by a kind of different thinking about health and wellness that often, you know, differs from the thinking and the knowledge found in modern or conventional medicine from Hippocrates onward or something. And so um, I, uh, I am just 
honored and so excited to uh, to have the integrative medicine health professionals a panel gathered here. Um, and so I wanted to uh, welcome you uh, on this panel. We've got um, we've got Randy Davis from Graham Hospital and Graham Health System in Canton, Illinois. And Mr. Davis serves the Canton community as Graham's wellness coordinator and as a personal trainer. Uh, Mr. Davis studied kinesiology at the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign and, and has uh, performed several roles as a personal trainer um, in his experience. We also welcome uh, Erin uh, Gallagher. She's a, a licensed massage therapist and owns Countryside Health and Massage, a practice that's lo located in Olney, Illinois. Ms. Gallagher has a specialty in prenatal massage and sees clients with all types of issues. Uh, we also have with us uh, um, Dr. Bonnie Jewell. Dr. Jewell is owner of and a doctor at Natural Health and Wellness in Carbondale, Illinois, where she's a chiropractor. Dr. Jewell's practice uh, is her second career after many years as a teacher. Props, Dr. Jewell. Uh, and uh, also finally joining us today from uh, Springfield, Illinois, we're happy to welcome Dr. Corey Myers, an, acupun an acupuncturist in the Family and Community Medicine Develop uh, Department at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. Dr. Myers holds a doctorate in acupuncture and oriental medicine, and he specializes in pain management and women's health and has a strong ed interest in meditation and using food as medicine. So welcome to you all. We are so glad that you're with us. Um, I, you know, I, I thought rather than craft uh, my description of integrative health, I thought it would be a good way to get started uh, to ask um, your thoughts and, and descriptions about the field. Um, I'm sure that most of us here we can understand the word integrate and what the, what that word just means simply um and so how how is integrative health what what is it how do we describe it let's just start there because i'm sure that a lot of folks that have joined us might want to just get started there and i'll turn um i'll i'll turn to you dr jewel if you don't mind just describing that thank you josh can you hear me okay? I haven't used this headset before, sorry. Okay, We're good. thank Thumbs you. Up. Great. So uh, I would say integrative health would be looking at the many different ways that we can help our body work better. So I agree with Corey that food is medicine. I'm a believer in meditation. I come from the perspective that food is what fuels our body and it what it's what makes it work. And I think a lot of what happens with integrative medicine is that people gravitate towards function, function of organs, function of bodies, and what we can do to make our bodies work better. It integrates with more traditional medicine or conventional medicine in that conventional medicine is great in a pinch. It's great for people who don't have access or knowledge about how to use food as medicine, people who are stressed out all the time, all these things contribute to the disease processes in our body. So I would say that everything works well to, together. As a chiropractor, I lean heavily on educating people in nutrition because if you have an inflammatory diet, your body's gonna stick and the bones are not gonna move and you're going to have inflammation around all your joints and in your body as a whole. So um, I, I love integrative medicine because it is a way that we can all work together to help our patients. They're all individuals. They all have their individual problems. They have their own way of looking at things. And I think when we can help people from different perspectives and different goals that we can really do what's best for our patients. I know that in my practice, I work, I uh, refer to a acupuncturist regularly. Um, work with physical therapists regularly. And so it's really fun and enjoyable to be able to help people that way. Awesome. Thank you for that, Dr. Jewell. Um, and so I, I'm, I've, I've heard you 
uh, speaking to a, a more whole health that a person's going to have from the very, very uh, essential. What is our diet composed of? And and and, and uh, so that uh, changing that can really be a big heavy lift for a person. Um, and 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 so I think that segues into. Uh, a question that I have about um, about uh, you know the idea of wellness, and so I was going to ask. I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Davis. So your role with Graham Health System is a wellness coordinator, uh, and when the the Health Career Pathway Production Team put this program together, we uh, we we use the word health coach, and so I was wondering, Mr. Davis, if you could tie together the type of work that you do. And how it relates, or how it is uh, relates to the uh, the role of a health coach, and and, um, and also what that means in terms of your approach in, in your in your workspace. Yeah, um, can you hear me well? Yep, perfect. Okay, yeah, so integrative health, going off of what Dr. Jules said, is kind of my job as a whole. Um, being a health coach is really what I do in every aspect, no matter what component I'm working with, whether I'm working with employees or different businesses within the community. Uh, the main kind of gist of what I do is help coach people on improving their health. Um, so with integrative health, uh, wellness, I'm focusing on wellness as a whole. So every aspect of that health Health, such as physical components, mental health components, what their nutrition looks like, whether they're being active, if they're taking care of their stress, such as doing yoga, things like that. Um, so I'm focusing on all components of health and really coaching them on ways to improve that. Um, I also work with our employees and different businesses in the community to get lab tests done for metabolic panels and blood counts. And so we can see if someone's glucose or if their cholesterol, um, just really how their body's functioning as a whole. And if they're not uh, meeting the health requirements or not requirements, but levels that they need to be, then I provide the resources and the guidance on how to get back on track and how to make those lifestyle changes in all aspects of health. Um, like I mentioned, to get back on track and get into the right health they need to be at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And like, I mean, and, and uh, lifestyle changes can be a, you know, that's a, can be a really heavy lift. Uh, yeah. change, changing habits, uh, changing habits is, it can be a really, really tough one. So um, I'm sure that, you know, so, so that having a coach, having somebody that's going to troubleshoot, like, how is it, what's stopping that new habit from, from being able to crystallize or happen is, um, well, is this, is this a really essential um uh, resource for somebody that's really trying to, to uh, improve their health. Um, and so um, I, um, I think, so there's a term health promotion too, that, that I, I, I really appreciate. And, uh, and um, so as a person that's in public health, um, health promotion it is, is really helping. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, a ways of empowering an individual. Um, and so I, I appreciate that. So I, I, um, I wanted to, to swing over to uh, speak to um, hear, I'm sorry, to hear some about um, massage therapy. And so uh, Ms. Gallagher, I uh, was wondering if you would mind giving, a, first of all, an overview of, of your work as a massage therapist and uh, and what that entails. So so just for the, the learner audience. Okay, hi. Can you hear hi. me? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Um, well, yes, I am a licensed massage therapist um, from Albany, Illinois. We live in a pretty rural area. Um, I um, graduated from Albany Central College. They have a two year program there available. Um, I own my own practice. So that in itself is um, fun and challenging, <laughs> but um, I kind of manage my own clients, um, payments, uh, taxes, website, you name it. Um, Business stuff. Up but there, huh? as far as, um, 
Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as far as uh, my line of work, um, I really, I'm saying, I, I really enjoy it all. Um, I see all different types of clients as far as um, people with back, back, neck, and shoulder problems, um, just re relaxation as far as decreasing stress, anxiety, helping with depression, um, and then physical symptoms like headaches, sinus issues. Um, I really try and focus on their problem areas. So, Great. Thank you. Um, appreciate that. And, uh, and what's, and then also just to, to make an intro, I also wanted to, to uh, make sure that uh, Dr. Myers uh, was, was, uh, first of all, welcome, glad to have you here as well. And um, I, uh, what, if you don't mind, would you just kind of give an overview of acupuncture as you see it? Um, this is a, I feel like this is a, is, is a, like I said, there's uh, integrative medicine is kind of obscure to a lot of folks. And I think uh, as a therapy, acupuncture it, it is not as well known as it probably could or should be. So, yeah, um, you know, in the integrative medicine world, there is a, there's a lot of different modalities, um, as you can see, um, and each one has, looks the body a little bit differently. Um, you know, either one's necessarily better or worse than the other. It's just, it's just different. Um, and so with uh, acupuncture um, and just East Asian medicine in general, it looks at the body like an, as an integrated whole. Um, everything affects everything else. Um, when you go to your doctor, you know, you have constipation, right? But you may have some asthma. You may have high, if you're older, you may have some high blood pressure. Um, you know, you may go see a cardiologist. You may just see a pulmonologist and you may see a gastroenterologist. Um, and it's really separate. It's like, oh, these things are not related in, um, in Western medicine generally. Uh, in Chinese medicine or East Asian medicine, it actually says, no, those are actually all related. Um, you know, everything affects everything else. And so one of the great things, one of the strengths of uh, East Asian medicine is it pulls together seemingly unrelated symptoms and uh, problems and says, no, they are related. And when you do, when you treat it, you treat the entire body. You're not just treating a symptom. You're not just treating, um, uh, you know, the main concern. You're actually getting to the root of the problem. You're focusing on actually fixing the problem, not just not just covering it up. Um, and so, uh, acupuncture is, you know, it's kind of cool what you see on TV, right? Yeah, <laughs> you have a hundred needles inside of someone's body. Um, I don't practice that way, um, but uh, by stimulating the body in very specific areas, um, you can cause physiological changes. Um, and it's not just, you know, maybe two weeks from now, you might notice a change. Um, in my clinic, I expect change in most cases immediately. Um, usually I, when I'm working with pain within 10 seconds. Um, and so very, very quick and you can see it. And um, these points as you see is uh, these lines that you see going down these colored lines um, are what's called channels or meridians. Uh, these channels meridians is a group of points that go up and down through the body and they all have a similar function put it that way. Um, and there's also a theory that goes along with it and helps you know where to put points, where to choose points and how to combine them. Um, obviously that comes with a, lot, with a lot of education, a lot of learning, but that right there, that picture that you guys all see holds a lot of information uh, if you just know how to read it. And so, um, uh, and so when you stick a needle inside somebody, you get a release of uh, neurotransmitters, you get a release of uh, natural painkillers, um, you can affect blood pressure, um, it improves blood circulation throughout the body. And so this picture right here, oh, uh, going back to, this picture right here is uh, just an anatomical way of uh, where the points are in relation to muscle groups. Um, and uh, where, you know, if you're trying to, if you're locating them. Um, and so if you want to go to the next page as well, you just pulled up. Yeah. Um, here on the side on the right is a little person that people kind of practice on. You can practice on needling. But uh, um, all these points um, are related to each other. Uh, and uh, the body is broken up into uh, different planes of the body. So you have the anterior medial plane, the anterior lateral plane, um, kind of like a pie. 
And uh, that's how a lot of these uh, channels are organized. If you think of it like slicing a pie six ways all the way down. Um, if that doesn't make sense, let me know. Um, but uh, yeah, so when you, uh, when you engage these points uh, with acupuncture or with acupressure, you create change. And so. Uh, uh, re reinvigorate pathways of energy. Yeah, that's one way to say it. Yeah, you can reinvigorate yeah. pathways of energy. Um, and uh, when there's a flow of energy and a flow of blood, um, things work, you know, yeah. things fix, you know. So, you know, we know that when uh, there's tissue damage in the body, you know, it cannot heal unless there's good blood flow. And uh, unless there's, and so if you restrict blood, so there's a lack of blood flow to the area, then it's not going to heal. And so one of the ways acupuncture does is, you know, when you talk about the concept of chi, um, chi moves with blood, chi moves the blood. And so when you stimulate this, it stimulates the chi, which moves the blood, which causes blood perfusion and causes blood flow to increase throughout the body as well as, uh, as, well as locally. So if you have an issue, uh, say in your calf, you see the picture here, uh, say you have some pain in the calf there. Well, I can put some needles in your foot, put some needles throughout the body that will actually increase blood circulation to your calf, which will then cause the, uh, the pain to reduce and cause the tissues to start to heal themselves. Cool, thanks. One last thing while we're while, while we're uh, talking about um, about this uh, is this picture on the right just a little bit over the top. Yes, that, that's okay. someone having that's someone having fun. Okay, um, that's not what you do. <laughs> no, that's not okay. what I do. So, folks, if uh, folks out there in the audience, if you go visit Dr. Myers, you don't have to worry about uh, the the image on the right happening to you. Okay, I was just wondering about that. That's Great. someone. Yeah, that's someone messing around. Okay, um, and these needles yeah. are, are are they do they do they cause pain? No, and so our needles are very tiny. Um, so if you think about a vaccine needle, when you go to the doctor, they give you a vaccine, right? right. Um, I can fit ten of my needles in one of their needles. My needles are also solid bore needles, so that means they're they don't there's nothing that they don't inject anything. It's not hollow. They're not okay? hollow. Yeah. They're solid. Um, they're about the size of a hair about the width of a hair okay. um to give you the exact diameter of it it's um one fifth of a millimeter we're talking about micrometers at this no no millimeter so okay. point yeah so we're talking about about a fifth of a millimeter so okay. very 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 tiny um and so you hardly even feel it go in okay wild okay well thank you for sharing that overview of uh, of acupuncture um, and so, so like Dr. Jewell said, she'll, she'll refer to, uh, she'll refer to an acupuncturist. Um, and, and I, I, uh, I would like to hear from you, Dr. Jewell, how it relates to, uh, to your practice of, of, of chiropractic work. Certainly. So with chiropractic, what I'm doing is helping people's function mainly with their joints and muscles. So if somebody's had what we call a hot low back, their back has gone out and they can't move. So there is very slight misalignment in their spine and that makes it so they, they can't move. I see that a lot of times with people who have overdone it. I think that's a pretty, pretty good assumption right there. They've worked too hard. Uh, you have your weekend warriors, they haven't really done anything all weekend, and then they're going to go play football, they're in their 30s, and they haven't done anything over the holidays, over when it's been cold out, and then suddenly their body just stops working like it used to, and they end up in my office. So what I help them do is I help get the joints aligned, I work with exercise to support the structure of the body, because the muscles support the joints as well. And that is very helpful to most people. However, you have the people who are very stressed out. Uh, the, the acupuncturist that I refer to, she will help people relax a little bit. Also, um, as Dr. Meyer said, it helps with getting the blood flow. Their joints are not gonna heal, their muscles aren't gonna heal as well if the blood isn't flowing into the muscles. 
So I would say the main, the main reason that I refer to the acupuncturist is to help people reduce their stress overall. It tends to be a very calming experience for most people. You take the stress out, you get that blood moving, and then everything starts, starts working a little bit better. Great. Thank you. And similarly, I, I, uh, I'm wondering, do you, do you refer out or do you advise uh, uh, in terms of seeking massage therapy? Yes, we have, uh, we do a little bit of massage in the office. Uh -huh. And when someone needs more longer sessions, anything like that, we do refer to a massage therapist. We also recommend uh, exercise. And uh, especially if you work with a personal trainer, that's a great thing. Most of my, the population I work with, with chiropractic are a little bit older, usually 30, 35 and older and they want to maintain what they used to be able to do and they're not really able to do it anymore. And so uh, that often takes a team effort to get the youth back. Yeah. It's basically what you're doing is helping people with longevity and uh, getting to feel young again with a little bit more caution than what they used to operate as. Great, uh, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to kind of take a tour and talk about, um, I wanted to talk about steps that, that, uh, that the aspiring health professionals in the audience uh, need to take or should consider uh, as they, if they were to move into the field that you all practice in. Um, and uh, I, I, we, the, the program, we've been using career ladders and I, I think that, um, it's uh, a really important to, a message to convey that, you know, first of all, uh, life does, happens in ways that we cannot predict. And I also want to message that not knowing for a, a young adult that's in high school or somewhere thereabouts to not know exactly uh, what they want to do, where they're headed is a, is super duper okay mm -hmm. and that um and that even if there even if a, a person might be fully set on on what where they want to head uh their twists and turns abound uh, and so it's important i feel like to look at things um uh stepwise and that uh and that you can move through a progression uh of accumulating skills and knowledge and experiences, uh, and they can transfer into something that you may have never thought you were doing. Um, and so, uh, Dr. Jewel, you have a, a, a really uh, interesting um, case study of that. Uh, and and uh, Ms. Gallagher, you, uh, in, a, in a different but similar way, uh, you're also a business owner. So I wanted to go into that in a little bit. But I, I wanted to ask Mr. Davis um, about, let's just say when you were uh, proceeding out of high school and maybe making your way to the University of Illinois, uh, did you foresee yourself uh, serving as a, health, as a wellness coach, as a, as a health coach? So uh, thanks, Josh. Um, going off of exactly what you just said, I had no idea this is where I was going to end up. Um, I originally went to U of I for engineering and I had mm -hmm. no intention of going into health and wellness. Um, while I was in high school, there were a lot of, uh, aspects that did kind of lead me down this path now, but at the time, even with my biology teacher at the time, she had a save like a book for health, uh, about anatomy and I kept a hold of it but I thought it was useless. And I was like, I'm never gonna refer back to this. Um, and then once I eventually switched, I was like, well, I guess she was right. I did end up needing this. Um, so no, I had no idea I was gonna head down this path. Um, so I advise exploring all avenues that you're interested in. Um, this was a backup and that was only because I kind of had to have one initially when I started at U of I. Um, but then once I got to U of I and started studying engineering, I discovered that that just wasn't what I was truly passionate about. And I took a look back and reflected on my experience throughout high school. And I really liked 
helping friends work out, getting people into fitness. Um, I loved studying anatomy and biology, and I had experience with physical therapy, um, both going in. Uh, I job shadowed at the time, so a lot of those aspects I was interested in. So then I decided I would uh, at least dip my toes in the kinesiology classes at U of I. And once I took one, I was hooked and discovered that that was what I was passionate about. Um, and then from there, I just started personal training. And uh, then that's when I knew that I was definitely going to um, continue down this path. I started doing more personal training. I jumped in as a group assistant trainer. I job shadowed more physical therapy. Um, I spoke with a couple uh, gym owners and then some wellness coaches as well. So then that's kind of what led me into this career. I want to, uh, I was about to interrupt you and, uh, but it was perfect timing because you said, you, you said uttered twice something that I, I want to reiterate uh, for, for the audience, which is uh, you said shadowed uh, and, and you did at least tw twice in your, in your progression. Yeah. Uh, and, and great. And, and so the folks, that is an awesome, awesome step that you can take in the immediate to just get a taste of whether or not a thing uh, is, is, is suitable for you. Is it a good fit, a work environment? So just like Dr. Ganson said in the first session in a musculoskeletal health session, um, which is kind of also a lot about what this session is about. But anyway, uh, that just, just to get exposure to the workplace, even if it's even if it's not in in the department or on the floor that that you think you're most curious about, but just getting in there and seeing what's what it's like uh, is is a really important valuable step that a lot of health um, a lot of healthcare either clinics or centers uh, systems. Uh, often make openings, and I understand pandemic-wise things are a little bit squirrely, but uh, there is a lot of facilitation of this thing with job shadowing. Um, so, and I'll just make an observation, Randy. It sounds like you you went from engineering into like body engineering, kind of. Yeah, you know, actually, like the engineering <laughs> of the biological organism type of thing. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, I had a, a couple mentors throughout college that actually mentioned that once I made that transition, they pointed out, well, you're still kind of doing the engineering yeah. aspect, just a lot more anatomy involved. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so this is, a, I think this is a good time I, I, that both uh, two, two panelists here shared with me in, in, in the very early planning of this session that um, that it took a kind of a major health kind of crisis uh, challenge to put uh, you on uh, on your paths. And that's uh, Drs. Myers and Jewel. So uh, Dr. Meyer, I was uh, wanting to, to, to ask you if you could describe for, for, the, for the, the class, for the gathered uh, group right now, uh, how that transpired. So what went on in your life and what put you on this pathway? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, similar to uh, Davis, um, I wanted to go engineering. Um, mm. I'm a family of engineers. Um, and at the time, I thought Chinese medicine was quack. You know, you couldn't have any less respect for China, for the field than I did at the time. Yeah. Um, and, and then I had a health crisis. Um, I went to the doctor and... Uh, um, we tried all the medications. I had all the severe, you know, call the doctor if side effects on your medication list. Yeah, uh, every every medication I had to call the doctor and say I'm this I'm having this reaction. Um, we did this for about six months, um, and after about six months, the doctor told me there's nothing left he could do for me. Um, I had dropped out of school. I lost my job. I was living on a credit card, um, and so a friend of mine said, "Hey, why don't you?" go to see an acupuncturist. And this friend had her own health crisis. I mean, she was having a lot of autoimmune diseases and she was getting better. And so I'm thinking, well, there's nothing left. I can, you know, since I didn't believe in it, I didn't think it worked. I was like, well, it can't hurt me. Um, and so I said, sure, why not? I have nothing else to lose. First treatment, my symptoms started going away. Um, and this, and uh, 
and we're talking, and actually I'll share with you is I, I, it's bipolar disorder. You know, I developed bipolar disorder and uh, the, you know, all the medications doesn't work. And so Chinese medicine is what started working for me. Uh, symptoms started going away. And my uh, acupuncturist is like, hey, take these herbs, go home, come back in a week, tell me how you feel. Um, and I was, I was like, sure, this has to be a placebo. This has to be a placebo. There's no way this could work. But I was getting better. And I really couldn't deny it. And so I was like, all right, there's got to be something to this. Secondly, my acupuncturist was a former chemical engineer. <laughs> uh, is, is there so, is there a, a theme there's, here? There's, there's a theme here. There's actually quite a few engineers in the in the acupuncture world. Uh, and uh, actually, a lot of the famous uh, there's actually a lot of famous acupuncturists who are former engineers. Just kind of wow. think of it. Um, and uh, uh, and so I started getting better, um, and I was able to get back into school. So this time. I had made some shifts and you talked about earlier about making shifts. It's okay. Not knowing what you want to do. I changed my degree like six times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, before and right before I wanted to become, besides becoming an acupuncturist, I wanted to become a nurse anesthetist. So I was already in the medical field. Uh, calculus kind of turned me away from engineering. Um, Yikes. That just wasn't my thing. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but I realized like, Hey, this is what I want to do. I got to help people get better. You know, I got to help fix the problem and help improve them and get to see instant results. You know, my, you know, get to see them walk in one way and literally walk out of my, my office better than when they walked in um, and they'll see that improvement. And so that's, that's how I came into it. Um, and to be honest, you know, half my family still thinks I'm crazy. You know, <laughs> half my family thinks. Uh, still quackery. Yeah. Half my yeah. family still thinks I'm quackery. They have a hard time wrapping the mind around it, but they also go, I, I can't explain how you're doing what you're doing. I can't explain you being able to function and everything as you're doing, but they just can't, they have a cognitive dissonance, dissonance there with what I do, but they can't, can't explain it any other way. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's totally okay. It's totally okay. If no one really believes in what you do, um, you know, it's, it's, it's part of life. Well, I think that's, I think that's slowly shifting uh, mm -hmm. and change uh, societal level change just it really moves slowly as, as yeah. we, uh, as we know. Um, and, and so I, I, I was hoping in, in, in bringing this up to the production team and, and including this in, in, uh, in our uh, menu for the, for the spring, uh, I, my hope is that the, the aspiring health professionals here are going to get a taste of a thing that they might not have thought about. And, and, uh, and hopefully perhaps maybe one or two of them might start to take steps uh, down a pathway towards uh, the uh, integrative health kind of work. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dr. Jewell, do you have any, uh, any reflection there? Cause uh, you similarly, you shared that, you know, you had a significant health uh, situation that, um, is what led you out of from a from a teacher to a, a to a chiropractor? Would you, do you have anything to share there? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. I um, so I was teaching overseas in South Korea, and my goal was to travel the world as a teacher. Uh, when I was over there, I started getting sick, and so I decided to move back to the United States so I could get some health care that I was familiar with. And nobody could figure out what was wrong with me. I was in considerable pain. I exercised a lot because I knew that that would get me better. Um, it didn't. I was having a reaction to a drug, an anti-malarial drug called larium, and that messes with your nervous system. So nobody knew what was wrong with me. I went to pain, regular doctors, pain doctors, um, and finally I was referred to a psychiatrist for uh, my mental issue because there was nothing medically wrong with me that they could find in the test. I took him seriously and I said, okay, there's something wrong in my head. I was living in New Mexico at the time. So I decided to go to pretty much every alternative healer I could find. I'm pretty sure my brain is about as clean as it can possibly be. Cause I went to every mental, whatever you could find. Uh, I went to Sedona, Arizona and sat in the vortex. I did everything and I was still in pain. So uh, I'm back in New Mexico, a friend of mine was seeing a chiropractor who also worked strongly with nutrition and I went to see her and she's the first person who said, oh, 
I, I've seen this before, I can help you. And then my healing journey started and I learned a lot about nutrition, the structure of the body. I learned about toxicity, overwhelm in the body and I was experiencing all of that. And so when I started getting better, I decided that I would change careers. And a large part of that is because I had learned so much on my heal in healing myself that I would, there was one teacher that I was working with and she was starting to get all these chronic issues. And I was like, well, you know, if you do this, then you might feel better. And she's like, you're, you're not a doctor. You don't know what you're talking about. Uh -huh. So that was one of those pivotal moments was I, when I was like, oh, but I do know what I'm talking about. So I decided to become a doctor so that I could help other people. And uh, I'm also considered a quack by many. I think old school medical doctors are not as progressive as the younger ones today. So younger ones are more likely to say, sure, look at nutrition, look at chiropractic, go to an acupuncturist. And so in the past 20 years, uh, since I've been on this journey, it's been really great because I've been having more and more patients who come to me and they say, yeah, go ahead. Um, work with this alternative therapies. Let's see, let's see what you can do. So that's been very helpful. Um, it is uh, kind of interesting being outside the norm, but at the same time, it's really great seeing the changes that are occurring with our healthcare. Because like you said, Josh, it's, it's changing and this is becoming not as unknown and it's becoming more known. Uh, I work with a lot of nurses. I work with who come to me as patients. I work with doctors who come to me as patients. And so it's just really exciting seeing the changes. Yeah, excellent. So you hear that, Hannah and Lance and, and uh, Justice and uh, Indian Valley, you all, uh, as, as, as future health practitioners, uh, you're going to be the one to carry this, carry this forward and, and, uh, and, and kind of bring it into the center. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'll just say this, and then I want to share a visual, and then I want to hear from uh, Aaron. But I'll just say this, that I think of, you know, there's a, another term um, that's, a, you know, complementary medicine, where, um, where these things can, can work in harmony together. And by these things, I mean, perhaps, um, you know, an alternative practice, uh, uh, um, therapies and treatments and, 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 uh, and ways to go about trying to get well, achieve wellness, can go hand in hand with, um, you know, going to visit the primary care physician and, uh, and, and kind of what we would, I think in, in American healthcare is the kind of like central script of, of how we go about um, being, you know, checking in on our health and, and attaining health, health, healthy statuses. Um, and so I really like complementary health as, as an idea. Um, and so I wanna share this one thing like I said, uh, and I have the wrong flag up, Dr. Jewell. So I, I don't know uh, exactly uh, why I put German on there and the German flag because you were in Korea, but here's- Oh, I, I speak German as okay. well. So okay. I was in Germany as well. So you could pronounce but that's this where I got right to. here. That's good, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Anyhow, folks, I, I built this quick little uh, visual because, uh, you know, uh, like I was like we have been talking about, uh, sometimes the pathway is not straightforward. I could say from personal experience, I spent, you know, 12 years as an educator uh, and um, and then just like did a pretty radical pivot, although I'm here gathered with a bunch of high school age folks. And uh, so actually, though I made, I say I made a big pivot, I'm still still doing a, a similar thing. But anyhow, the point being that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you, we need to be open to making major shifts in what in what, what we're doing or what we think we're headed for. Uh, and so this is a, a quick case study of Dr. Jules, which is that she took a, a proficiency test in high school that said, you're gonna be a great mechanic. Uh, and then she moved to move forward about going about a, a life as a teacher, her first career as a teacher, rock on Dr. Jewell, and then did this m massive, you know, cross training phase where she went about uh, building up a new, very different skill set. Uh, and now um, is the owner of her own business and a, a, a practitioner of chiropractic medicine. So uh, I wanted to use that to segue uh, to ask um to ask um 
Miss Gallagher, if you would share, you know, now we're in the like uh, business owning thing. So you're, you know, in addition to providing health services, um, you also uh, run a business. Um, and I, I wanted you to maybe, uh, if you could explain some of the some of the pros and cons, some of the highlights of, of you work for yourself ostensibly uh, and you own your own business. Um, and so I wanted to hear your, your, your comments there. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to share. Um, well, there's a lot to owning your own business and um, managing your own um, clients and patients and whatnot. Um, I, I like the flexibility of it. Um, I work part time for right now, um, and it suits my schedule. And um, it, it's like I said, the flexibility is awesome. Um, as far as like managing phone calls, appointments, um, tax stuff, write offs, um, looking at my website, making it up, making sure it's up to date. There's a lot of just different things that go into it. Um, like a variety. So overall, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, overall, I think the major pro of it would be just the flexibility, um, working when I want, scheduling clients when I can get them in. Um, it's I can't, off the top of my head. I can't really think of any cons, but that's uh, a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. But other, other than that, um, I mean, it's it's a, it's nice to be able to do all of that myself and not have to rely on someone else to do it or, or pay someone else to do it. Um, currently I don't have any employees, but I mean, I all, I'm, uh, I'm an LLC now, so I, I could, I just, right now it's, it's nice just working by myself. So. Excellent. So the, the kind of the, the broad take home I'm, I'm, I'm hearing is, is the, the amount of flexibility that you have. Um, it's like you can kind of tailor make your schedule for yourself. Um, great. Um, so I, uh, I wanted to now just kind of cover uh, a round of advice um, for, for our, our attendees here. So um, it's a small group, but I was hoping to uh, just to hear, just to take once around, and uh, and and one one piece of advice, maybe two, whatever, um, to to folks that are uh, about to emerge and enter into maybe enter into the health health field into a health profession. So, um, if I could start with uh, you, Mr. Davis, and uh, and any any bits of wisdom for the folks here. Um, I think my advice would have to be explore everything, uh, every aspect that you think you might be interested in, um, even if it's, it's been something that you haven't really been interested in a long time, but you say 10 years ago you had some interest in it. Definitely look into it. The job shadowing, like we mentioned, you just get to see a real world perception experience of that job and what that will actually entail, um, as opposed to what you may see on TV or online or just what you the idea you might have in your head. Um, and so getting that exposure and that experience for across the board, different job opportunities, you can really discover what you might actually be passionate about, something that you might not have thought to be interested in um, is actually a path that you might want to travel down. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, and uh, Ms. Gallagher. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a couple pieces, I, I think. Uh, first one would be just don't settle um, and to keep, keep pushing yourself. Um, massage is not what I wanted to do in high school. Um, I really didn't have any idea what I wanted to do in high school. I think um, I did go to a community college um, after I graduated. Um, I guess I originally thought I wanted to be a dental hygienist and did a round of shadowing there and quickly realized it's not what I wanted to do. Um, but uh, so the shadowing is definitely a plus for anyone interested in what you might want to do. But um, and I'll always have a like a willingness to learn. Um, keep that trait about you and um, you'll go far. 
Thank you so much. Those are great pieces of advice. So I'm hearing shadowing twice here. That's great. Um, and uh, Dr. Jewel. Yes, so I would say uh, yes to what everybody else has said. <laughs> and also be open to the unexpected. Uh, life is full of unexpected, so just be open to that. Sometimes we think we're headed down one way and then life gives us an opportunity. So just to stay open to that. And then I would also say to pay attention to what you love to do. And someone told me this once and I think it's really great. You know when you love to do something because time disappears when you're doing it. And so if you're going to be engaging in a career and you're slogging a log and it's not fun to do it, that's probably not going to be the best for you. But if you find something that when you engage in it, time just disappears, a few hours go by and you're like, oh, wow, that, you know, what happened? That's a good indicator and stick with that and just uh, stay focused on helping people. It's the best thing we can do. Awesome. Definitely stay focused on helping each other. Thank you for that. Dr. Myers, words of wisdom, sir. Yeah, uh, again, I'll second everything everyone else just said. Um, and to uh, tag on to what uh, Dr. Jewell said, um, when you're it's more about just college advice, I mean, you're not, you're not supposed to, you're not going to like every course you take, uh, but that doesn't mean you're going to hate your career. And so um, if you're really passionate and you love your career, just know that you'll find a couple classes that you just don't like, and that's okay. Uh, you're going to find that's difficult. That doesn't mean you'll be a bad practitioner or a bad whatever you become. It just means that's a hard course. So um, just push through it and, uh, you know, keep your hope up for that career. You know, love the career, not necessarily the class. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, every cow has its butcher. That's a piece of, <laughs> that, you know, that, uh, that uh, you're bound to run into that, that doozy of a, of a class, uh, even uh, as you're pursuing something that, like you said, you, you feel like you're going to genuinely enjoy and you hit this thing that's like I'm just chewing you up. And uh, I think those are some of the most uh, fortifying, uh, you know, uh, experiences in our lives, those things which uh, are really, really grueling and challenging and oftentimes even like just downright horrible uh, can really uh, help fortify us and strengthen us as, as people. So I'm here in shadowing for sure. And I wanted to throw into that uh, uh, aspiring health professionals. I wanted to throw into that um, the value of, of finding and, and hooking up with a mentor someone um someone that's that's uh, got a, a vantage point that you appreciate that has a, a skill set that you value and feel that you can learn from and and uh, and that that there's a, a genuine um, there's a genuine mutual uh, interest in the partnership of the mentor uh, you can not not all uh, uh, attempts at, at at reaching out to to gain mentorship are going to be successful, um, and and you just have to you have to kind of proceed forward if if it's not actually a good fit, let's say. Um, but uh, having someone who's been through some of the things that you're going to be going through, um, that has a vantage point, that has a, a perspective. Uh, on the other side of that uh, passage of that journey is super, super critical. So do seek out a mentor as you proceed forward in your pathway, whether it's in health or in any other uh, kind of uh, any other kind of pathway. Um, I wanted to open to questions. Uh, we just got a, 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 a new uh, a new person that joined the gallery. So welcome. Um, and um, we're, we're right at the Q&A section. So I don't, I believe that you're gonna all be able to unmute to ask questions. Um, Ms. Beth's class, if there, there's a portion of Ms. Beth's class left, if you all wanna unmute and ask questions or everyone is welcome to use the uh, chat box to, to uh, ask questions. Um, so, these folks are here for you. Please ask ask away if anything comes to mind. There's no silly question. It can be small and simple, like uh, how big is the needle in used in acupuncture? 
As an educator, I used to use that awkward silence like, like crazy. Um, however, on Zoom gatherings, it's a little bit different. <laughs> it's really easy to hang out behind the mute button. I I, uh, I know that that I know that myself personally. Um, so uh, you know, we covered all of the things that I have notes on, and um, I have I, I have a, I'm sorry. You know, go, I have a question for you know. Uh, Dr. Bonnie and uh, Randy and, uh, um, and Gallagher, what was your education like? I think you made a good point when you said uh, you might not love the class, <laughs> but, but you'll love the profession. It was grueling and highly competitive. And I started, I don't know, with 70 people in my original class, I think 10 or 15 of us graduated. So it was it was quite grueling, I would say, and totally worth it. Nice, yeah. Cool, thanks, Dr. Jewell. And I, uh, a question just came in. Um, hi, exclamation point. I am in high school and I am wondering, what are some tips to be prepared early for our pathways? I put the emphasis in there on early. It's just all regular text. So how, what are some tips to be prepared early for our pathways? That's the question. Yeah, take it away. We can talk over each yeah. other. Yeah, good, good study skills, um, but also good break skills. So you don't need a study 24 seven. And I actually, when I was in college, I used to be a tutor for a study tutor. I used to teach people how to study. One of the techniques for studying is taking a break and relaxing. Um, so have good study habits, but also have good relaxation habits. I've heard that actually it's during the relaxation that, that the information grabs sticks. <laughs> the stuff you're studying actually, it, it gets assimilated. Yep, good sleep, especially while you sleep. And so. Okay. so yeah, I, I used to, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna say, I used to do 10 minute naps I would do a really hard study session for like 45 minutes or an hour, and then I'd basically pass out and I'd wake up and I was smarter. It just happened that way. And so <laughs> that was that was part of my strategy. And also uh, I learned that I, I learn best between three to 6 a.m. So I'd go to sleep at eight or 9 p.m. and I'd wake up and I'd study from three to six. And I got a lot more done than if I tried to pull all-nighters or stay up, so sleep as well. Yeah, Davis. those 10 minute naps uh, definitely came in handy quite a bit. Uh, I know I had several friends always come up and try to like startle me or were just surprised at what I was doing when I was sleeping for a few minutes in the library. Um, but yeah, I also studied better and kind of later hours. Um, but so really finding the time that you function best and that you learn best. Um, and then off of what Corey said, organization skills and time management skills. So study, like schedule times to study and be organized about it, be prepared for it. Um, but also in that earlier preparation for myself, just trying to discover what I wanted to do, I went and visited with counselors um, and I took several of those online tests to help me determine what I was good at and what path I should take. Uh, it still didn't end up getting me where I ended up, but it did set me in the direction that actually led me here inevitably. Um, so still take those, still talk to counselors, kind of go over those things that you're good at, what you're interested in, and they can help guide you and uh, kind of set you in a good direction. Yeah, those career tests are only guides. Mine said nuclear engineer. Yeah. Mine said uh, pipe organ maker, for real. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, but that was a great question. And I appreciate the question, uh, Dil Nort. So, you know, I, I'm hearing, um, I'm hearing a know yourself in terms of when you do good learning. So like a, a know yourself as it, as you move through seasons of your day uh, and, and really op optimize 
or so that you can optimize uh, and make the most of your studying that you're going to do. I also am hearing a message of like, be like Mr. Davis says, like be organized. So really, if really optimize your study so that you can afford yourself breaks and that you're not just a stressed up wreck all the time with the study that is interminable. Uh, and so if, if you can be efficient with the time in there, you'll, you'll, uh, earn yourself some space to, to step away. And I think stepping away is really important. Yeah, I'll share a little bit with myself. Um, when I was, to become an acupuncturist, it's a master's degree. It's four years uh, beyond your bachelor's. Um, but during the time I was married and I had a kid um, and I lived an hour away from my school. And so I would li ride the light rail, um, basically from my house to the school and back. Um, 45 minute, 45, 60 minute ride. So I'd sit on the bus with my textbook studying so that when I got home, I could do, you know, be a dad be and a I dad, could be a yeah. husband. And so I can, I can be there for my family. And so I spent two hours, you know, which gave me two hours to study, you know, uninterrupted study time. Um, and so, you know, sometimes obstacles, uh, a lot of times I say obstacles are just opportunities for innovation. So nice. Thank you. Thanks y'all for sharing on the, uh, the little uh, tips. These are like pro tips of life. <laughs> and thanks for the question again, appreciate that. Um, any other questions? We're right, right nearing up to the end here. All right. Sorry, oh, let me put no. my headset down where you can hear me. Um, and this one was um, the, another high school student who's wondering some things that they can do to help them stand out from other people working towards the same goals. That's a great question. I'm gonna leave it open before I call on anyone. Anybody got anything? Go ahead, Dr. Myers. Yeah, so, um... I've met with some of the presidents of the acupuncture schools and just talking with them and talking about their admission process. And um, a lot of these schools require an interview. Um, and so this also goes, we'll go for a career and getting a job, but just getting into a school itself. Um, you got to make sure you're just good. Like you, know, you got to, uh, your presentation, like they got to want to love you. They want to want to have you. Um, and so having just good social skills be able to communicate, be able to work together, work as a team. Um, you know, there's a, I know uh, I was talking to the president of one of the acupuncture schools that would turn people away if they, uh, if they just got a bad vibe from the person interviewing. It's like, they just, you know, not, not, not that they stutter, nothing like that, but their um, full body communication, their engagement, if they seem disengaged, if they don't really see into it, if they just seem whatever, um, they, they turn away. Um, and so if you want to stand out, you got to make them want you by being that person, you know, being the standout, um, you know, cause on paper, y'all look, everyone looks the same. Everyone looks the same on paper. Um, yeah. it's really how you present yourself. Um, and so. I think there's a, a an authenticity, um, kind of, maybe that, that might a bare relevance right here, you know, being your authentic self. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I would I would add to that uh, if you're not sure how to do that, to look at Toastmasters International because they teach you how to present not only to groups but how to present yourself in the best light possible. It's Toastmasters International. Excellent. Thanks for the question and thanks for the. Uh, the illumination. I would like to back that up though. Um, so that I got two things. Uh, one, go above and beyond, get those experiences. Uh, you'll probably hear this a lot down the line, but stack your resume. Um, so get a part of those organizations, those clubs, do research, um, get anything that you can to add to that resume. But as uh, Dr. Corey said, Everybody looks the same on paper. Um, so definitely get those interpersonal skills and those social skills developed. I have had 
numerous times, it, more than I can count on one hand, um, in an interview at the end of the process, I've heard from the interviewer that I've been chosen over groups of others just because they didn't get good vibes from the other person. Um, other people didn't have good social skills. When they were put into a work-specific setting, they couldn't communicate effectively. And all of these positions along integrative health, you're going to be working with the public public constantly and so communication skills are almost top of the job I have gotten positions where I've been told they would have hired people that were underqualified for the position as long as they were able to communicate effectively you can coach someone and teach someone up on the science uh, and the education behind these careers, but you cannot teach social skills very well. So it's key to have those social skills and the ability to communicate with directors above you, people below you, the public that you're working with. There's so much more to communication than just speech. I mean, and so even if you have a stuttering or something like that, like that's just only part of it. I mean, if you can engage them on a physical level, or you show that you're engaged with them, um, attentive and listening, active listening is part of speech. It's part of communicating. Um, you have to make sure that they're, you're in there with that person. And that actually comes really important when you're working with patients. Um, you know, I was working in a community clinic where I'd spend max two minutes with a patient. I know that doesn't seem very much and it wasn't. Uh, I'll actually max more four minutes. Um, but when they were with me, I was there. And they felt heard and they felt taken care of because they knew I was listening to and I was taking care of and giving what the best good. So yeah, you know, it's that same skill goes over to being a healthcare. You got to be present with them, no matter how long, if you're with them for 30 seconds or you're with them for an hour, um, you need to be present. And that same skill goes over for you know interviews and everything else like that. And I'll just add one piece and I'll try to do it quickly uh, to whomever I was asking that question. And actually everyone, everyone here right now, um, I, I, here's a way that you can double dip service work. I know that you've probably heard it. I'm sure counselors, maybe, uh, maybe others in your life have, have suggested go volunteer. Well, it's, there's a, here's why I say double dip. First of all, like Dr. Mr. Davis said, those look great on paper. They do look great on paper. But you got to imagine the other candidates in the pool probably look great on paper in a similar way. Here's the second dip. You actually get a lot of practice in communication and building social skills. When you go into an experience where you're going to, let's say, volunteer with an organ organization, like you don't really know them. There's a there's a it's a whole uh, it's a whole kind of journey of the awkward very first moments to opening up to finding bonds to it's it's really good practice in what what you'll face when you're going to be interviewing for a position uh, or interviewing for a school uh, it <clears throat> really can solidify your interpersonal skills and it will undergird some compassion i would imagine so do get out there and serve your communities we had one more question come in. I know, Josh, we're trying to wrap up. So I we might are. ask that, well, what's that if someone has anything really quickly to say on this is what were some good motivation tricks that you found to help you um, work towards your goal? Dr. Jewell. Yes. I would say keep the end in mind. And don't worry about actually feeling motivated because the majority of the time you might not feel motivated and lean on just being disciplined. Just set up that structure, do what you say you're gonna do. You can gripe and moan the whole time, but just get it done. I hope that helps. <laughs> Eye on the prize. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we are six minutes beyond by my watch here, um, but for good reason, because we're, we're getting some questions. And, uh, and so to all of the question askers, we're grateful, super grateful that you're engaged and you're, and you're really thinking about um, 
your place along a pathway, whatever that pathway is. We kind of do selfishly hope it's towards, uh, you know, a health career, but it could be in any direction. And what it, what's most important is that uh, you find fulfillment uh, as you move along that pathway. Um, huge, huge uh, message of gratitude to our panelists. Uh, thank you all so much for, for uh, donating your time, for sharing your expertise and your insights uh, with our, our aspiring future uh, health professionals. And I um, want to wish everybody a lovely Friday afternoon. Uh, it's pretty nice to do this on a Friday.